In the spirit of reconciliation, the Gravel Cycling Australia podcast acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So I'm sitting here drinking a Hawker's West Coast IPA um, from a fairly well-known Melbourne brewery in Reservoir. You know, something about gravel and beer kind of seems to go hand in hand. I know not everyone is like into their beers, but uh, there just seems to be a bit of an affiliation with a nice craft beer and gravel. I have to agree with you there. I think that's um, that's definitely true. It sort of fits with a more relaxed, laid back, sort of adventurous you know, weekend exploration sort of thing. I think, you know, everyone relaxes with a beer and they relax when they're on the bike. So why not, why not do the two together? Yeah, well, I'm I'm tuning in. I'm on I'm on I'm on brand tonight. I might cut some of that. Might keep some of it. <laughs> I think it's good beer chat. Welcome to the Gravel Cycling Australia podcast. Gravel cycling in Australia is booming. From racing to bikepacking to simply getting off the beaten track and exploring the back roads and trails of our outstanding natural landscapes. This accessible subculture is all about community, adventure discovering or rediscovering the joy of life on two wheels. Join us as we celebrate Australia's gravel cycling scene and discover the locations, explore the events and meet the people at the heart of the sport. So welcome back to the Gravel Cycling Australia podcast. My name's Tristan Reid, I'm your host and we're in for a real treat on the pod today. We're sitting down for a fairly wide ranging chat with James Wilson about all things gravel. But just before we jump into our chat with James, I, I just wanted to take a moment to, to thank you all for, for getting behind the launch of this little podcast over the last few weeks. The, the response that we've received from the community, it's, it's been really humbling. And I, uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to say thank you. And I particularly wanted to thank those who've taken the time out to uh, reach out and, and offer their words of support. I think as we all know, it can be particularly nerve wracking to, to put yourself out there and, and take a leap into the unknown. But the response that I've received from from you, the community, it's been really encouraging and and given me great motivation to to see where we can go with with this little project. So so thank you very much, and yeah, it really does mean a lot. So with that out of the way, let's get back to our chat with James. So as I mentioned in the intro there to the podcast, when I came up with the context for this pod, I, I decided I wanted to get to the heart of Australian gravel cycling by hearing from the people who make this sport tick, and I'm looking forward to doing just that in our chat with James today. As we'll hear, James is a long-time cyclist who got into the gravel scene perhaps earlier than most. He's based up on the Central Coast in New South Wales, but has ridden his bike all over the country. He founded Graveler and is now running the Overlander, a specialty gravel-focused bike shop in Wyong. He's also an ambassador for Rafa Australia and Skin Grows Back Performance Bike Carry Equipment. But most importantly, he has a passion for the gravel community and gravel cycling culture. James, really excited to have you on the pod today, and thanks so much for giving up your time to share your gravel story. Yeah, thanks, Tristan. Pretty exciting podcast that you've launched, and considering I was thinking about gravel back in 2016, maybe even earlier, it's good to see that we're kind of getting some traction in Australia, and it's becoming a real genre in itself. So, yeah, thanks. No worries. I think, um, yeah, it's, it's certainly coming into the mainstream a bit more, but sort of at the same time, keeping that alternative culture, uh, which we all love about it. I have a feeling there's going to be a bit of something for everyone in our chat today. I'm guessing not too many of the listeners will be familiar with you. Can you take us right back to the beginning and tell us a bit about how you came to cycling and then how you ended up in the gravel world? Yeah, thank you. So for me, I probably started cycling middle of life. So not as a as a young young fellow sort of riding around for lots of time i actually had a bmx when i was like really young and my number one regret was probably stopping cycling and starting surfing cuz i grew up on the northern beaches of sydney and you know it was it was cooler to actually surf than to ride a bike so i got my license i started surfing and then fast forward a few years i, I was married with a couple of kids and I had kind of really settled into married life in a way and and packed on quite a few kilos. Um, and 
yeah, I was kind of a bit unhappy. But look, what happened was um, a few mates invited me to go mountain biking. And I went, yeah, let's just have a go. And I took a very inappropriate bike mountain biking. But despite that, um, got completely hooked on the thrill of riding a bike and the thrill of actually setting short-term goals and, and watching them grow. I then, I guess, started racing. You know, things accelerated very quickly in a short period of time. And the type of racing I got into was single-speed mountain biking. And those who are listening know that single speeders are probably a unique group of cyclists, um, slightly unconventional, uh, choosing one gear as opposed to multi. And I loved it. Like, I really just really dig the culture. I love the challenge of actually cycling. And in New South Wales, really hit the, um, the four-hour enduro scene, started doing longer rides. So, you know, your 100K is and longer, 12 hours, um, teams 24s and was really enjoying the cycling scene and then I kind of had a bit of a a bit of an epiphany or a bit of a moment where I came to my cycling where I was just doing it for going through the process and went I need to do a bit of a reposition so I'd started commuting to work and the commute for work for me was uh, about 100 kilometers um, either via train or split commute and I built up a gravel bike. And at the time, so this is back in 2015, gravel bikes were kind of like a, what's this weird um, drop bar with fat tires? And it's perfect for a commute. And so I started commuting on this gravel bike. I could jump gutters, I could go on single track, I could do stuff that I love doing, but I could do it in the commute. And guaranteed, every time I commuted, the roadies would go, wow, look at those tires. They're so fat. How are you keeping up with us? (laughs) So that was kind of like the the bit of the vibe. And and then things kind of snowballed a bit further and I started riding more. Um, I'd stopped racing, but I'd actually started riding for longer distances just for the fun of it. Sat down with a mate and we went, maybe this gravel thing might take off in Australia. So this is back in 2015, early 2016 and founded um, what is known as Graveler, as you introduced. And and, and Graveler effectively was a community of, of like-minded people riding the distance and exploring back roads and, and really just trying to push the envelope around um, longer rides. From a community point of view, what uh, it was attracting was mountain bikers like myself who were keen on riding longer And also people that were traditionally road riders who were looking at um, adventure in a safe way. Look, personally, I'll say I haven't gone completely nutty. Like I haven't done um, a race to the rock yet. I haven't done the indie pack, which people may be familiar with. But but what I have done is continue to stretch what I thought was my normal around a a decent ride to include multi-day, whether that's bike packing, flash packing, and and just getting out and and just really embracing the countryside that we live in. Yeah, it's a beautiful way to see our country, isn't it? On the back of a bike, you sort of connect with with the landscape a bit more than you would uh, certainly in a car, and and you sort of see more of it than you would if you you went for a hike or a walk. So I think it um yeah, it's a perfect way to to see our landscapes. Sorry, you mentioned that you got into the single speed mountain biking scene, and it was a bit alternative. Do you think? the same things that attracted you to single speed mountain biking ended up attracting you to gravel in terms of the culture? Yeah, look, I I think if you consider the road culture in club-based scenes and people being very strongly affiliated with their local club, I think gravel has kind of crossed those boundaries in Australia and also other countries where it's more around the enjoyment of the bike and the thing that I think is pretty cool about it is that you can get people from guys that are, you know, full road hitters to mountain bikers to cycle couriers to um, people that are just like new into the sport of gravel now. And it's inclusive and it's diverse and it's about the journey of riding a gravel bike as opposed to getting on a podium. But gravel is kind of crossing the boundaries and I think. It, what it's doing is it's allowing people to enjoy uh, cycling 
in a less serious kind of way. And and it's it's really embracing. And I think personally I've found that community that's associated with gravel in Australia is just growing and it's growing stronger and stronger. And you have different elements of that community in different parts of the country. So what you might find in say, you know, the the greater Melbourne region, the community might be slightly different to that we find in Greater Sydney or where I live on the Central Coast. But you've got people that are like-minded who are keen to ride, keen to explore their, you know, I guess test their boundaries around cycling, but in a less serious kind of manner. And yeah, and occasionally we might go out and try and smash a com on the road, but like Strava is not the be all and end all of, of, of life. And getting out there and having an experience with your mates is probably better. Yeah, it's a very, very grounded experience. I certainly um, know what you're talking about there in, in my sort of much shorter uh, history in gravel, but I think I think I can completely agree with your, your thoughts. Looking through your Instagram page, you, you've ridden your bike sort of all over the country, as far as I can, as far as I can tell. Do you have, do you have certain locations that you uh, you think are pretty cool for for riding gravel, or do you have a favourite, or you sort of you like your local area there on the central coast? Before COVID, I was working in a role that actually I had the opportunity to actually travel a lot in Australia, and one of the things that was pretty unique about that is I got to take a bike with me on work trips and was able to structure my work um, around that. Apart from my local area, which I think I don't want to tell too many people about because it's pretty magical and I don't really want to getting it overwhelmed. So there's some secret spots up on the New South Wales Central Coast that I don't really want to disclose too much. That aside, Tristan, Adelaide and the greater gravel region around Adelaide in South Australia is absolutely off hook and phenomenal. Literally, probably 15 minutes from the CBD, you can be on amazing back roads and gravel roads. Melbourne, as a city, has hidden mixed terrain and gravel that locals would know about it. But you, you know, you can ride out of the Melbourne CBD, and you're actually on the Yarra Trails, um, and they they go on forever. I um, had the 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 kind of the wild experience of living in and working in Alice Springs for three weeks and discovered that Alice Springs also has amazing trails and such a really vibrant cycling community. And, and then if we come back, I guess, closer to my place on where I live, the, the greater Sydney region on the outskirts has some amazing adventuring as well. Uh, places like Windsor out in the lower Blue Mountains, um, another region called Wiseman's Ferry, which has actually got gravel, which is up into uh, the Hunter Valley. There, there's a, a, a mega playground of roads to explore, just yet yeah, within close proximity uh, to, you know, to Sydney CBD. The great thing is you can explore those areas by train, and you can get on a train from Sydney CBD, go up north for you know an hour and a bit, and then you can go riding. Yeah, we're pretty pretty sport for choice uh, right across the country. I think. It's, it's a bit of an untapped. I think that's why gravel is probably going to take off even more is that we've got all these places to ride and it's just a matter of people discovering them and, and getting out there on uh, on their gravel bikes. Yeah, agreed. I think, Tristan, the thing that's really cool about gravel is that you have people that are doing, say, 50-kilometre rides, like just you know a couple of hours. You've got people that are strapping bags to their bike and, and doing overnight trips. And you've got people that are doing multi-day um, sort of trips on a, the same sort of bike. Uh, and whether you camp, whether you stay in hotels, or stay in pubs, it, it's a, a way of exploring our country and being fully immersed in it in a way that you wouldn't in a car. And, uh, you know, you the, the, the bike is such a, a great leveller. You can pull up in a country town and people come and talk to you. Whilst in the city, you get abused for riding your bike on the road. <laughs> so, it, so it seems to be this way of engaging people um, in a different way. And, and you know, when you tell them where you've ridden from to get to somewhere, they either think you're crazy or that you're very determined and, you know, a unique person to talk to. <laughs> uh, Speak, speaking of riding a, a long distance, I, you mentioned there that you've sort of look to push the limits of, of what you can achieve uh, on the bike. I noticed you've you've done some pretty 
epic things. You've you've ridden from the Central Coast down to Wagga to line up at Wagga Gears and Beers over a few days. Uh, in 2020, I think you rode your bike every day of the 366 days of that year. That's just bonkers. How did you manage that? Was that difficult mentally to to commit to getting on the bike every day? Yeah, so that, that's a, a good question. So at the start of the pandemic, I personally came up with this challenge to ride my bike every day. And so from 2020, I actually rode every single day for that whole year. And I said to myself, I'm going to ride for at least 30 minutes and at least 10 kilometers every day. That that was the basic goal. That ended up um, being longer rides, no matter if it's raining, hailing, snowing. I don't get snow, but, you know, like you get the gist. Um, even if it's a heat wave, I just get on my bike and I ride. I think getting into the habit was kind of the start. Then once it kind of kicked over, my uh, stubborn determination also took kind of kicked in. I got to the end of that first year and uh, some smart ass on Strava said, what are you going to do next year? You can do the same. <laughs> and I went, yeah, game on, brother. Let's go. So I did it. <laughs> oh, yeah. So it was co- <laughs> So I actually effectively rode back to back for about yeah, two years straight. Uh, I, I don't know who that individual was that inspired me to ride two years um, on my bike every day. I've forgotten. <laughs> but thank you. You know, like that was a bit of a just a just a thing that I did. Some of the rides were kind of funny. Like I rode on my parents' property on a, a an old BMX bike that I had when I was a kid. You know, recorded on on Strava because that's the source of, <laughs> source of truth. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm very impressed. Well done. I'm definitely excited to explore some of the more philosophical sides of gravel with you a bit more. But before we get too deep into that, let's let's talk a little bit more tech. Um, so yeah, what are you riding at the moment? What's your what's your current garage? Okay, so um, I don't do all of my cycling on a gravel bike, um, just due to practicality. I do a bit of road as well, just to kind of keep my base case up. Um, an average for me, an average week of cycling is probably about 150 to 200, maybe 300 k's a week, just depending on what's on. So good base of road and road is really it's actually really addictive and after being an originally a mountain biker getting onto the road and going super fast and sitting on a 35 40k average is actually really exhilarating but you can't do it all the time so so currently um i have a roadie that is um a secure belgi um and they're uh based in melbourne great uh, brand australian brand they produce awesome bikes since you mentioned earlier in the intro i've set up a shop with uh, my business partner matt leborg and we um, have a range of gravel and adventure bikes and so i'm currently spending a bit of time riding a bomb track we'll kick ext carbon carbon gravel bikes are an interesting bike to ride comfortable sporty super quick 650b super Super fun and plush ride. We also stock a brand called Chimera. Chimera are a handmade steel uh, bike based in the Hunter in um, just north of the Central Coast. And that bike is a, a prototype gravel bike that they're producing. Um, again, 650B. It's a one by setup. So a 42 front chain ring and 1146 rear. Um, really good range. Nice wide set of handlebars um, with nice flare on the drops. That bike is just comfortable and just really springy. I've also got a couple you, you of you, your listeners are probably thinking this guy is a classic cyclist who just has bikes in his shed and they just continue to for days. Uh, I've got a dual suspension mountain bike. And that, when I ride that in the local trails, is so much fun. It is just unbelievable. And because you met, I mentioned earlier, I'm a mountain biker from my background. After getting into gravel, I kind of ditched suspension for a while and then got like full suspension front and rear. It's just like amazing with a dropper post. Like I haven't quite gone dropper on my, on my gravel bikes, but um, dropper on the mountain bike is amazing. I also have a single speed Salsa El Mariachi, which is a bit of a collector's item now. And I bike pack on that. And that the, the people think, 
single speeding and bike packing that just doesn't make sense yeah it seems to work out okay the only bad thing is you get a top speed and the top speed for me is like about 27k an hour where you just spin and you just kind of maintain that so it's a broad range of bikes and and they're all just so enjoyable and they all have their benefits and their, their good points and their bad points and it kind of just depends on the vibe i've pretty stoked that recently those of you who are listening and think i'm completely cracked i've got a single speed gravel bike that i'm about to take delivery of and i can't wait to get on that thing there's an event um, that's happening later this year called the dirty warning which is going to be from geelong to uh, warrnambool in victoria and my goal whether i do it or not is going to ride the dirty warning on a single speed um so 246k with three and a half thousand vertical and i'm going to have a crack at doing it plenty of uh climbing in that event for a single speed that's um that's a brave move i think (laughs) but good luck i'll be interested to see how you go i've looked at the profile it's all up front so we're just once we get over the mountains and the off off ways which i've actually ridden in a few years back we'll we'll see how we go yeah good luck um you mentioned (laughs) you mentioned wheel sets there a bit you seem to have a preference maybe for for 650 b's on on gravel is that would you say that's correct yeah, so like a, a few years ago, there was a, a friend of mine, uh, his name's Adam Macbeth, and worked. he's worked in a few shops. The last shop that he was in was Commuter Cycles in Melbourne. And Adam was such a fan of 650, and and I'd he'd sold me a bike or two, and I thought, well, let's see how we go with 650B. And initially, I was really sceptical of the, real, the wheel size, but what I found is that it it's just fun like it is actually really fun to ride and it depends on your tire rim combination but say you know i run either a terraval or a panaracer tire so panaracer um, gravel king sk and the terraval is the cannonball either of those two tires roll really well and on 650b like i've actually ridden my gravel bike with guys on the road and able to keep up with them you know, with the 650 and it just creates just a little bit more bag in the tire and just a little bit more, just, just a little bit more fun. Once you've ridden 650B, there's no turning back. A lot of people kind of get into the gravel and they go, oh, 700 is what I'm used to and, or which 700C is also 29er in a mountain bike standard, identical size. They're just mountain bike is 29er and the road was a 700c i think 650 gives you that extra bag of tire which gives you the ability to run a lower tire pressure which gives you more grip and it gives you more comfort and despite the thought that a lower psi or you know say 30 psi in a tire is going to be slower depends on your input to the bike you can keep up with people and once you hit the off-road sections and it gets quite technical you've got extra cush on your tire to actually go through those technical sections and you've got extra grip to actually hook into the corner um, which kind of comes into those technical skills in riding off-road what, what's your preference for for tire width yeah a 47 or a 48 i think works really well and and my personal choice would be run as wide as possible that your frame would allow um, you see some people riding tires where you can fit a credit card in the frame. Probably not so good if you get a rock in there. But if you've got plenty of space, then yeah, just go as baggy as you can because it's going to increase your comfort. And especially over a, a longer or a technical ride, it's going to give you just that more more comfort and and the ability to enjoy yourself. Most gravel bikes don't have suspension. You know, there's a few now on the market that've got suspension front fork. But most of them don't. So you can imagine that a tyre is going to give you that suspension factor um, in your ride um, and gives you that extra extra kind of comfort as opposed to uh, losing your teeth when you hit a corrugated section of road. Yeah, yeah. It's um, I was riding down our way, sort of down around the surf coast, uh, just just after Christmas there and it's certainly sort of in the middle of summer can those corrugations can shake you off a bit and I was aching for a bit more air in the tires so I might have to I'm, I'm running 40 
just 40 C, uh, sorry, 40 millimeter tires at the moment. And I think I, I probably can't get much more into my Canyon Grail frame, but I might try and go up to at least a 42 um, to sort of help with that, I think. But the key question here is, are you running tubeless or tubed? Oh, yeah, I've been running tubeless uh, since about a month after I got the bike. That was um, awesome. I would never yep. go back after that. <laughs> it makes it made such a big difference. And, uh, yeah, if anyone's still riding tubes, I have to tell you to get them out and get some sealant in there because it will change your riding experience um, like, totally. like nothing else. Um, Jesse Carlson from Curve Cycling has a great saying, is that tubes are for surfers. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good yep. one. Yeah. The thing that made me change and I, I came straight home and went and bought myself some sealant was a, a patch of tarmac road actually here in Melbourne. Uh, I don't know if people are familiar with the, the Ivanhoe Boulevard, but the sort of the unmaintained end of it that links up with the, the Yarra Trails there in Ivanhoe. And it's, um, I think that the locals there prefer, they ask not for the road to be prepared, uh, not, not to be resurfaced because it keeps keeps the traffic away from their street so it's a gives it a bit of character but it's um yeah it'll rattle your teeth if you're if you're running too high pressures <laughs> lesson learned yeah lesson there we learned. Go. so you work a bit with rafa as well can you can you share with us a bit about their philosophy on gravel because i think many people probably associate rafa as a brand and please i i sort of want you to correct me here with this sort of downtown fashion focused high end you know sort of elitist side of road cycling mm. it sort of seems a bit at odds with sort of the gravel culture as we've been discussing what would you say to that characterization of the brand and and what do you see rafa bringing to the gravel space yeah really really good question so so rafa uh, one of their slogans as a company that it's more than a ride. And that really, I guess, calls out to adventure and how adventure on a bike can open new horizons for people. So, yes, Rafa have got their EF education team, um, and that's their main kind of pro sponsor um, in the Peloton. Uh, you will know that Mitch Docker, former pro, and then um, Lockie Morton, uh, also quite well known. They're both renowned for actually getting out and exploring. Like Mitch um, has recently done a transfer ride to the Tool Down Under where he took a whole crew of people there. And and it's, while well, there is an aspect of Rafa where you've got a finely uh, dressed and fashionably, re I guess, respectable brand potentially, there's also the spirit of adventure, I think the Rafa as a brand uh, seeks to embrace. There has been a an affiliation with Rafa uh, and gravel, but it's it's around creating experiences for people to actually get out and ride the bike and ride their bike and whatever expression they have, whether it's gravel, road, mountain bike. Now it's just about the experience and and I think around the connection that cycling can bring for people. People kind of go, "Well, Rafa's so expensive." Well, it it kind of it's an investment for your cycling. Oh, I think all quality kits expensive, isn't it? It's, um, <laughs> we haven't yeah, chosen good. the cheapest hobby, unfortunately. <laughs> so one of the one of the other brands you um, work with, and you mentioned bike packing and adventuring a bit. Skin grows back. They're an Australian brand that look to produce some pretty cool kit. Can you tell us a bit more about them and and their products? Skin grows back are Australian owned and manufactured. They're manufactured on uh, the New South Wales south coast uh, around Ulladulla. And the owner of the brand um, is a former cycle messenger and also does a bit of, a bit of mountain biking and, and loves his cycling. And they have a range of, I guess, bags um, for your bike. They're functional. They work really, really well. They originally um, imagine a cycle courier with their their, their the satchels, Skin Grows Back started manufacturing satchels as one of their, I guess, their core products. A lot of cyclists now have like a little, you know, I guess, tool bag um, under their saddle. Um, Skin Grows Back produces those. More recently, they've got into larger bags suitable for what we know as a flash packing trip or like a extended gravel ride where you stay in a pub. Um, so they've got a whole range of bags there. They have feed bags that that I've tested over longer periods of time where 
they have insulation. So they actually keep your bottles or your food um, insulated and cold over time. And they just work really well. Oh, sounds like good stuff. Yeah. Bulletproof. It's awesome. So let's talk a bit more about the shop and what you're up to at the moment. Um, do you want to share the story of the Overlander? What was what was the inspiration there? Yeah. So, you know, all of us across Australia and the world have experienced quite a few uh, lockdowns during the pandemic. Like one of the good things out of COVID is that um, my business partner who I've mentioned earlier, Matt LeBorg and I, we, we, we live locally and we're riding and we both had a real um, passion on starting up an adventure bike packing and touring shop in the region where we live on the central coast of New South Wales because there wasn't a store in that nature. And so with that in mind, um, we started planning over a 12-month period what the Overlander would be. For the listeners, uh, some of you may know that Australia has quite a unique history of bikepacking and the original bikepackers were known as the Overlanders. And the Overlanders um, would do these amazing trips before cars um, from Perth to Sydney and the other capital cities via bike. And they would carry everything with them and they would do these amazing missions across the country and they were known as the Overlanders. And I guess with the spirit of the Overlander, and I kind of pay credit here to Jesse uh, Carlson as well, he's um, done extreme amounts of research in in the Overlanders and done some real, I guess, historical work around the the spirit of the Overlanders within Australia. We thought bikepacking the Overlander sounded like a great kind of concept. And so, yeah, so we went with that. The focus of our of our initiative is around community, around building an inclusive community of bike enthusiasts, gravel, adventure, and bikepacking. Uh, we launched in May of last year, and those of you listening may know that bike retail has suffered a little bit since the pandemic. You know, while everyone was trying to get bikes during COVID, looks like the economic pressures in Australia have kind of reduced people's spending. So retail wise, we're, you know, we're not going completely gangbusters. But what we're really proud of is the community of cyclists that we're building around our shop. And so <clears throat> the real focus for us is around getting people that are like minded together and riding, whether it's a short local ride, which is 30 to 50 Ks, or you know, like we did last weekend up to a hundred, maybe longer is just getting people together to ride their bikes and have a shared experience and enjoy just some of the, and I know I said this was top secret, some of the majestic areas on the Central Coast that we can ride. Where our shop is located is in, it's probably the oldest trading building between Sydney and Newcastle, and it's called the Chapman Building. It was built in the 1900s. So it's actually a heritage uh, listed building. And it has a real artisan kind of character about it. And the shops that are based there are quite bespoke kind of shops. The Central Coast in New South Wales historically has been a fairly rough area generally. Wyong particularly was a bit rough. And it's it's kind of gone through a bit of a gentrification. So it's an area where small businesses have been attracted. There is a vibrant cafe scene. Um, there's vibrant eating by the time the pods launched, there may have been a festival called Love Lanes Festival, which is a celebration of the different lanes in the region of Wyong. There's music and celebration and performance and dance and, and a real a real cultural aspect. And we've been able to position ourselves in the centre of that and create not only a retail outlet, but we're creating also an eco-tourism outlet and um, looking at we get people from Sydney and Newcastle coming to our rides and really showcasing um, what the Central Coast has to offer. Um, You know, we're only a short train ride away from Sydney, um, but uh, after living as a resident on the Central Coast for now probably over 20 years, it's quite a a beautiful area just away from Sydney CBD. I was um, was gonna ask you what sort of cyclists you're attracting to those shop rides are we talking people who have a long history in gravel or are they 
roadies who are a bit gravel curious or are we sort of getting first time cyclists coming along because they feel it's a an inclusive environment where they can sort of test out the scene a bit or a bit of everything perhaps yeah chris and we're getting a bit of everything and i really like that term gravel curious so the whole gravel curious sort of term is you know people that are you know they want to test the water i think last weekend we actually had one of the riders was a national uh, gravel champion actually came along um and she came out from sydney and we get people a crew from newcastle coming down we've got people that are you know that have ridden road that are really keen to get into gravel um we've got mountain bikers that are keen to you know long ride longer when we're not discriminatory discriminatory sorry about the type of bike that people ride so we have people that have you know turned up on e-bikes it's okay we accept them you know we don't think they're cheating it's they're still riding their bike we get mountain bikers and we get people you know riding gravel bikes the focus for us is around get out there ride your bike and be a part of the community as opposed to you need to have this type of bike you can't join us or um, you know you need this type of kit you know one of our um, our riders is a guy who like i think a couple of months ago was riding extreme enduro downhill um, trails in new zealand descending it off jumps he loves he loves gravel <laughs> but you know when he's not riding gravel he's sending it like as hard as possible it's ridiculous and so you've got people that are you know stretching their boundaries and you know this guy who rides enduro downhill stuff he's now got into gravel and he's riding you know 50 and 70 kilometer rides and for him that's like a real real stretch to his his you know thoughts around cycling and he loves it like he's he's really really enjoying the cycling and another example there's a fellow um at the start of the year um this guy was um over 135 kilos he's decided that he just really needs to just drop heaps of weight so now you know where we sit it was probably like six months ago he was 135 kilos he's now about 105 he's an absolute gun like he's an absolute machine on the bike so he was strong beforehand and now he's absolute he's a he's a machine um and he's just he loves it like everything about riding gravel he loves there's another guy who joins us on our rides who for many years was riding by himself around the trails around where we ride and he's discovered the overlander as a shop ride and um, he's professionally he's an exercise physiologist um, so he prescribes exercise to people to help change their life and do rehab he loves our shop rides and yeah but but i think it's inspired by a community and inspired by a group of like-minded people um, getting together and there's a bit of banter but it's nice and inclusive um, and people from all, all you know, all walks of life are encouraged to to come along and, and ride their bike, um, and it, just enjoy the challenge. So, if people want to get involved, when when's the ride on? Where do they have to go? What can they expect cool. in terms of distance? All right. So, um, unless it's raining, the Overlander ri- ri- runs rides from the New South Wales Central Coast, leaving Wyong um, at uh, nine o'clock most Sundays sometimes 8 30 and we're advertised via our social media which is um, at the overlander.cc what can people expect they can expect to see some great gravel in on the new south wales central coast uh, range of rides from 30 up to 100 kilometers depending on the actual route um, if it's a longer ride we give people plenty of notice um, so they can prepare i.e snacks food and spares generally it's around the 30 to 50 kilometer mark coffee is a big focus on this ride it's a sunday after all so it's a coffee before and a coffee after the ride Um, and where the overlander is based is actually there's a a very um, amazing cafe um, within two shops from where we're based Um, and then afterwards there's there's food at the cafe but there's also korean barbecue and a cocktail and whiskey bar is about to open up as well next door that could be dangerous, but we'll maybe we need to do a repeat episode um, after that's opened to give you an update. <laughs> no, it sounds good. So I get the sense you're a bit of a, a deep thinker and we've sort of touched on sort of the community side of, of gravel and, and how important that is to you. 
I was hoping to get your thoughts on a few more sort of, of the philosophical questions around cycling. So I um, hope you're mm. happy to go down that path with me for a minute. Great. Bring it on. You've written before that the bike is more than a tool for exercise. It's a positive mental health machine. Can you tell us a bit more about what you meant by that? So the fact that the bicycle is probably, um, it's probably very simplistic mechanically, but what it has is the ability to um, give people, in some cases, renewed hope and a purpose in their life is actually quite um, quite amazing, purely for the fact of not only the physical aspect of pedaling, the fact that when you start exercising, I think the, the experience of riding a bike is actually, uh, I think, quite meditative in some ways. And we hear a lot about mindfulness. The fact of actually pedaling a bike and focusing and being in the moment is actually quite a mindful activity coupled with the fact that you're actually doing it sometimes by yourself but other times with other people in a shared activity kind of build strength and community around the actual physical activity for me when i personally came into cycling i was probably pushing 115 to 120 kilos and pretty unhappy in life, a middle-aged, um, young family, um, working a couple of jobs and just really looking just for just a breakthrough and a simple invitation from a friend to go, do you want to come mountain biking? It was like a ticket for me that snowballed into losing weight, actually becoming happy as a person and then seeing progress in a way that's very tangible. It's I think the thing about cycling personally has opened so many doors and I've got to meet such a diverse range of people. And I, I count that as a complete privilege, the people that I've met in my life through cycling and the doors that have, that it's opened from an opportunity point of view has been um, more than I would have expected. Just in the fact that we're having a chat around cycling and gravel, that's what's actually connected us as um, you know, as two people who, you know, up until recently, we didn't know that we existed, but the joy of cycling has kind of connected us. How cool is that? Yeah. You know, it's, like that's it's pretty great, isn't it? Yeah. And, and while we might be from different parts of Australia, we may have different professional backgrounds. We may have different personal backgrounds. Um, our family background might be different. You know, our cultural background might be different. Cycling is the thing that connects people. And it's a level playing field. Um, people jokingly in my workplace, they say, isn't cycling the new golf? I said, yeah, absolutely. It's probably not quite as expensive as golf. Maybe in some cases it is. Depends but... on your, uh, your attitude, <laughs> I think. Yeah, but it's, it's that whole shared pursuit and that way of connecting people. And, and, I, and I just think it is that transformative power that it has. If you think about other countries outside of Australia, having a bicycle in the community makes a massive difference to people's life and the outcome of their life. And that's why we've got like the World Bicycle Relief Fund. That's why I've got the Masaka Cycling Club. That's why I've got a range of these cycling specific charities that make a difference for people. Um, generally, I just think, what would I be like if I wasn't cycling now 15 years after I started? I think I would be a lot, um, I would definitely be not as happy, would be, I'm grumpy at the best of times, my partner will tell me that, um, but at least I'm less grumpy riding my bike. So um, based on our sort of brief conversations, uh, I think you've got kids, that's right, they're probably a bit older than mine. Yeah, so, um, so my girls are 23, 19 and 14. So one of the things that I'm sort of constantly thinking about as a as a father who loves the bike and I'm always sort of striving to try and get that balance right between, you know, family and work and leisure and riding and obviously now podcasting as well uh, and, and, you know, contributing to the housework and all those other things that we try to and we need to jam into our increasingly busy lives. To be honest, it can sometimes be huge stress to try and get that balance right. 
Um, and sometimes I feel that trying to fit in my writing, you know, even if I'm doing it before the kids are up in the morning, it can still feel like a bit of a selfish pursuit. Mm. So I guess what I'm asking is, do you have a, a personal philosophy on this and how have you sort of managed the bike and, and family over the years? It's a really good question. And I think from a family point of view, and maybe there are other listeners where this isn't as important, is being a parent, you're taught to be less selfish in general. And ideally, um, you want to be there to see kids grow up. So that's where I have at times had to compromise and go, what is most important about you know, is cycling more important than actually seeing my family? And I've comp- I've compromised that on that at times. And I'm also the first to say I haven't always got it right. So from a relationship point of view, I've learnt to um, acknowledge that I haven't quite got it right and um, be upfront and transparent about that. And then have also sat down and planned and I guess, negotiate um, from a point of strength rather than actually begging for forgiveness all the time is actually seeking some permission to actually be involved in in the cycling activity. When cycling focused stuff becomes part of your lifestyle and income, i.e. setting up a business, that's when it becomes a little bit more challenging. Fortunately, that said, I work from home majority of the time so I have a little bit more work-life balance rather than commuting or being away from home but it's I think for me what I've really tried to do is focus on what is the impact of this activity going to have on my family and also acknowledging I'm not going to be a world champion so at the end of the day it's a passion but it's not going to change my life Uh, those those that ship was sailed many years ago when I was still surfing. So, so it's around shared activity and, um, and really, you know, supporting, um, you know, su- supporting the home front and, and being available. Yeah, thanks. So a big part of gravel cycling that we all love is that it can take us deep into some of our country's most beautiful places. And we've sort of discussed that a bit already. Mm. I think we, we probably get to see and appreciate these landscapes from a different perspective than the average person would on the street. In those moments, I often find myself thinking about our First Nations people and the connections that they built with landscapes over the past 50,000 years, but also how much damage we've done to that culture since 1788. I know this is something that is close to your heart. Do you have any ideas about how we as a gravel riding community can best acknowledge traditional owners of the lands on which we ride? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. So... Um, for for the listeners, um, the context for that is I'm adopted and I'm a, six, a fifth or sixth generation Australian. I definitely know that I have Italian heritage on my father's side, um, but I actually may have potentially some Aboriginal heritage on my biological mother's side that I'll actually never, never find out, to be perfectly honest. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And as a cyclist who um, is engaging in country, I think just being respectful that we are on Aboriginal land is important. You know, political beliefs aside, um, our First Nations people have, I guess, gone through multiple years of challenges as a people. And the little that we can do is, um, I guess, call out and respect country as we as we cycle through it. And take our time to learn about our Aboriginal history in Australia. Thanks, James. Really enjoyed the chat today. Thanks for coming on the pod. Um, Was there anything else you wanted to discuss before we wrap up? Any other thoughts? No, just keep up the great work, mate. And and I really look forward to listening to future episodes and just really um, hearing more about the rich, um, I guess, gravel um, community that we have in Australia. Uh, it's building and um, it's super exciting that you've, 
you've launched this. And um, yeah, I can't wait to hear more episodes and um, you know follow the journey. And and ideally, we can go for a ride at some point in the time next time I'm in Victoria. Yeah, that'd be great. Let us know. Great. Sensational, Thanks, mate. Thanks for the time. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Really, really enjoyed that chat with James today. I think he's he's got some great insights, particularly around you know what it is to be a part of the gravel cycling community and. And hopefully we can all uh, relate to a lot of the things that he was talking about there. So in the next few weeks, uh, hoping to get around the country a bit, heading up to Queensland and and over to Adelaide and Perth, meeting some more of the people at the heart of this sport uh, and learning a bit more about some of the really exciting events which are on the calendar coming up that hopefully we uh, can all get involved with. As always, you can get in touch with us on Instagram at the Gravel Cycling Australia podcast or via our email at thegravelcyclingpodcast at gmail.com. As I said at the start of the pod, it's been really encouraging and really exciting to see the response that we've got to, to the start of this little project and, and really excited to continue to grow this community and, and go on this journey together to really celebrate what we all love about gravel cycling. So that's a wrap for today. Uh, hopefully you can join us next time on the Gravel Cycling Australia podcast.